hmm, your scale book, the scale book I have written, and I could design the scale book to help you quickly progress along your life of cello. I did, you know, first published it in 2013 after six years of study with my students there in California, and I found it to be most effective to teach things a certain way. Revised in 2018, once again in 2020, and we'll get another revision in 2023. We start with one octave scales. In every one of these pages on my scale book, you get a QR code. The old versions don't have all the pages, but the new versions will. And that QR code, when you scan it with your phone, this is a QR code here, that will bring you to a video on the YouTube channel, which will explain this entirely. That's, yes. You, on every one of this, I try to maximize the amount of information in this uh, book. We have a subtitle which tells you more information. So basically you start with a very strict up and down of the D, the G, the C, the F, the B flat, and the E flat. And the reason I do this is it's your straight, the same fingerings across D major, start on the D string. So we have the D major, and of course, we'll go to the G major. And the reason why we go in this order, G major, C major, because the fingerings are the same. So this is a G major scale, which is the one right here in front of you. G major, and as you notice, there is one hashtag, one sharp sign. And then we have C major. Now let's do the C major. Same fingering starting on the C. Turning the page, we play F major. And you'll notice now we have a little flat B, which is a flat. It's the first key signature with one flat, which is the F major. We continue to the B flat major, which is right here. And B flat has two flats, B flat and E flat. Starts on the second finger here on the G string, which is the new finger we just were introduced with the F major scale. The next is the E flat major scale. Play the same fingerings, starting on the lowest string, the C string. You'll notice there is something called a minus one in this music right here. And the minus one indicates when you have an extension to the flat A or flat E in the context of the E flat major. It is here, the flat A, and here, the flat E. A minus one is you have a note that's lower. Just remember on cello, every time that you move this direction, you are making the string longer, and the longer the string gets, the lower the frequency it makes. The shorter the string, the higher the frequency, the higher the pitch. So when you move your hand down, you are shortening the string, thus you are creating the pitch higher. So when you shift high, when you move high, when you go high, when you go sharp, you go physically lower to the ground world of opposites. And when you go low, when you make, I say go low, I say you're too sharp, go flat, make the note lower. You have to literally raise your hands to the sky. You will never hear a cello teacher speak to you in the context of physical, you know, uh, uh, location, always in context of the pitch, which means lower, higher. So this is an E flat major one octave scale.
We continue to the natural minor. First, look at, let's look at E flat major has three flats, the B flat, the E flat, and the A flat, three flats. And in scale exercise number two, the natural minor, we have starting what scale? The C minor, and we have three flats. And then you see a sort of reverse engineering of what we just did. So we're gonna play C minor, G minor, D minor, and you will notice that each one of these has the exact same fingering. Some of them are a little funky. I don't know what's happening here, but I was going to erase this. <laughs> there we go. That was a little funky there. See, sometimes I make edits to this. There it is. And when I'm teaching. So there we go. As you see, the G minor, the C minor, and the D minor all have the same fingerings right here. Oop, let's get a one that works. There's, see that fingering here? See the fingering here? It just starts on different strings, and then this fingering right here. They are all identical, going from one flat, two flats, and three flats. We start here in the C minor, exactly the same key signature that we just ended in, which is the relative major of E flat major. <laughs> We play this relative major now. We're going to play the exact same scale beginning and ending on the same on the C, but playing three flats. This is the C natural minor. In the subtitle here, we have the Roman numerals indicating the type of string that we are playing on. The first string is the A, the second string is the D. The third string is the G, and the fourth string is the C. And so, it looks and sounds like this, C minor. The next one is G minor, same fingerings, start on the G. So now we have G minor, same fingerings. We follow G minor with D minor. Now we continue with A minor. A minor is the very first time we use a shift to the upper second position, signified by this sort of dark orange color. And if you are unfamiliar, then become familiar with my color codes. These are colors that I specifically chose when I had a student who was severely colorblind, and we sat down and we went through all of the tones these are the RGB, these are the codes for the RGB, I think RGB, um, hex codes, so you can match them to your computer. It's gonna come out differently on printers. So these are the hex codes that you can associate with, the half position, lower second, low, upper third, upper second, lower third, upper third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. So if it doesn't look like they're much different, there are supposed to be subtle differences. I've used this color code system for over 10 years in two continents and it works wonders. So if you don't have these colored brackets in your scale book, that means you have to watch these videos and match it up with your colored pencils. In other words, you have to make the music your own. I can't do all the work for you. A minor, E minor are the exact same type of fingerings. B minor and F sharp minor are the exact same type of fingerings. There is a shift to the upper second position, and there is a shift from the lower second to the fourth position in the last two, the B minor and the F minor. A minor has no flats, no sharps. Sounds like this. E minor sounds like this. G 
B minor sounds like this. So you take your hand, put it in first position, slide up a half step, start on the B. When you see a plus four in my pedagogy, there is a plus four right there. It does not mean to extend. The plus four only in indicates a precise finger in a precise location. It is always the finger here, the fourth finger, and it's always between the first and the fourth position. And to really drive this home, I'm gonna show you here on my electric cello right here. So this is the first position here. Let me turn that a little bit. There you go. To turn this better. This is the first position, and this is the fourth position on my cello. I should be doing this in my electric cello, and I'm not. This one single dot is where the, if you put your fourth finger here, that will be the plus four. It does not mean an extension. It only means an exact digit on an exact location. That's all. In order to know if it's an extension or not, you have to know if the extension, of course, always between one and two along the neck. If this is a whole step or half steps, you will only find the extension between one and two along the neck of the instrument. So two plus four, zero, one, three, you're not in extension because you're not necessarily playing the one. If you were, then there would be a little X that I've manually draw in between the ones and twos, which you probably see in my scores as of late. Okay, just to drive that home. Now we're back to the acoustic cello. So there's our B, slide up a half step, second finger, two plus four, zero, one, three, four, then shifting to fourth position, one, three, that's here, Roman numeral two, meaning the second string. And then F sharp minor, crossover, do the exact same fingerings. My counsel for shifting accurately is to allow the thumb to guide along the back of the neck, guiding your middle finger and thumb together. That's the way I teach. I've helped many people throughout the years to gain better intonation by associating the thumb with the middle finger. Some teachers talk about it generally in the back. I actively tell all my students to align the middle finger with the thumb because on cello, remember, cello is different from life. Life, you walk around like this, okay, not like zombies, but sometimes. Huh? And as you see, we're naturally aligned. The thumb and finger index and thumb are naturally aligned. That's the way the mother nature has created us. If you do this, we are naturally aligning these digits. That's 99% of your life. Now, if you're a cello player, cello asks you to make the dominant relationship in the hands between your middle finger, your secondary digit, and your thumb. Here it's like this, and here I ask my students to think about this, because then you make a variation of extension and non-extension between index finger and the thumb, and that's why when you shift along the neck, when I'm here, I'm going to play this B minor. I'm going to show you the back here. I'm going to take that finger and shift up. And all I have to do now is either choose to extend or not. And it's really universal for everything. Okay? Now let's go to the next scale exercise, which is the octave on a string. And before we continue, just remember, scale exercises are there to teach you sort of how to go about, learn the different places, learn the different notes. All cello asks you to know is 24 here. Four, 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 four. Okay, four, four. Um, that's, that's all. You have to memorize 24 notes before you get to the fourth position. That's all. Can you memorize 24 notes in their places? That's it. It really helps you. It's like, so if you want to do a quick game with yourself, Ask yourself how quickly can you find and then name a note and then take a time uh, stopwatch. Take a stopwatch like this one here and then try to find as quick as you can. So I'm going to choose one. Actually, why don't you choose one? Make it a hard one. And I'll start it and see how many I can find. Tell a note to me. B. Oh. There it is. Oh, that was.
was terrible. I was trying to tune my notes, all right? Oh, that's embarrassing. Tell me another one. I'm going to try to find eight in less than 10 seconds. Oh, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do eight. I didn't do eight. I didn't do one more. Let me redeem myself. I'm getting a little bit better. Eight in 10 seconds. That's expert level. Oh, that's it. Oh, it's getting higher and higher and higher. <laughs> I have a break of the 10 seconds. Okay, let me re redeem myself one more. Trying to break 10 seconds. D sharp. <laughs> <laughs> I did it before it ended. <laughs> so you can make, have fun with it. Okay. Have fun with it. Have fun locating these notes. Okay. So, um, I, I'm just going to continue with the scale book for now. Octave on a string is a, is an exercise that I like um, to teach to how to quickly move up and down the fingerboard, moving to the fourth and fifth position very precisely. Then we do a chromatic one, two, three fingering, a chromatic scale fingering, which I find to be great because you start to feel the distances between the spaces of your fingers. And of course, your two octave scales, right? So I'm going to end with two octave scales today. I'm going to quickly just go through all of these, play each of them in succession so you know what they are and you know exactly what is expected, for instance, here in the octave on a string, you shift to the fourth position and then the fifth position for the A, the D, the G, the C. And for the E major and the B major, we have shifting to the sixth position. And there we have this little manually drawn X signifying the extension between the one and two. See the one, two plus four? That tells you only between the one and two, one X two plus four, Again, the plus four is a precise location. So without further ado, I'll go through all of these octave on a string scale exercise number three in my scale book. <laughs> If you have questions up to this point, then definitely review the ones that you have to have questions for. You know, that's a wonderful question. The question has been asked. There are so many to learn. Are there really many to learn? We've only done, let's look at how many we've actually looked at. We've looked at D major, A major, G major, C major, so three four because of a major okay there's one in there we've looked at some minors so we've had associated minors one two three four five six seven minors and the f sharp minor associates to the to the a minor so we have seven minors 
and we have one, two, three, four, five, six majors. So six, seven majors, excuse me, including the A major and seven minors, and they're both related as in the relative major and minors. Three sharps, F sharp minor is relative to a is relative to an A major. B minor, two sharps is relative to a D major. E minor, one sharp is relative to a G major. So all of these are linked up two by two by two. So essentially, you have seven scales to learn, seven scales to learn and their associated places. You start your minor scales on a different place from your major scales. So yes, you have one, two, three, four, five, six. Then you have six here, and then you have the seventh with the A coming in there. The two added ones at the end here, you can do a little bit later, E major and B major. That will be a little bit higher. Seven scales of the major and minor, 14 in total. Yes. And then you're wondering, well, why should I learn all these? Again, if I were to put something in front of you, or your teacher were to place a piece of music in front of you, and it were to have, let's say, I don't know, two sharps, D major. Or is it maybe B minor? Regardless of whether it's D major or B minor, how confident are you in playing a D major scale? Not just one octave, but two octave. Not just using two strings, but on two strings. Not just playing the relative major, but maybe the relative minor. And the more confident you have, these little building blocks of happy, 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 the more confident you are when you look at that piece in D major, like, easy, easy. You don't have to learn all the scales before you play another song ever. You learn the associated scale with the associated song. You are a chef. You're, we're walking. You're coming into the kitchen, the cuisine, the musique. Okay, you were coming. We're going to cook up a musical meal. Are you going to fillet a fish today or not? A lot of chefs don't know how to fillet a fish. Are you going to be cooking some, some pasta or are you going to be cooking some, some risotto? It's different. It's, they're similar, but they're slightly different. Are you going to, going to be doing a dessert in addition? There's all these little levels that you're going to train on. So if you're confident as a chef to cook, cook a certain meal, you're going to continue to stick by that. If you're good at baking, good at frying, good at, good at meats, good at saute, good at all these different things. We've all seen these chef's shows of competitions. And the chef says, I'm really good at something. But then they put them on a dish that they've never done before. Scales is a way of you being that chef knowing, I got that fish over there. I know how to flay that fish. I know how to cook that risotto. I know how to, to you, know, you know, maybe uh, cook a uh, chicken or a, or, or a cold and blue or something. It's that level of confidence you could do before you have to serve the musical meal. And, and so this is why we have our scales because our scales build confidence and the more variety of manners by which we can navigate a simple scale, the more confident we are when we're tackling a more, more uh, complicated piece. Last two exercises, I'll just go through them quickly, is the chromatic scale, starting on the G, starting on the D, and starting on the A. We start here in the half position, then the upper second, fourth, and then sixth. It's the same across all three of these strings. Always a one, two, three fingering. Now this is the G chromatic, followed by the D chromatic, followed by the A chromatic. Thank you. 
absolutely love the chromatic scale because you really feel the fingers squishing together. You probably saw that happening, squishes together and it gets wider as you go down. And then of course we have the associated two octave scales and it does the exact same as scale exercises one. G, C major, G major, D major, A major, adding that one because we've had that one. F major, B flat, E flat. Here we have our lucky seven exercises. So I'm going to now play them quickly now for you. Erase all this because that's explaining the arpeggio. Okay. C major, no sharps, no flats. Two octaves. Followed by G major, then D major, then A major. Zero, one, two, and three sharps. Zero sharps, C major. The next is G major, starting on the G string. The next is D major, extended position on the two low strings and then relax on the two high strings. D major, starting on the low D. Now, A major in the exact same fingerings then shifting up to the fourth and then fifth position, a shift you've already learned in the octave on a string. A major, two octaves. The next is F major. One flat, second finger here, and of course a low one here, shifting to the fourth position at the end. F major. B flat major starts and ends on a B flat. We end in the sixth position here. We play here in the lower third position, fourth position, and of course, first position. So here with the extensions back, fourth, lower third, and then we have here the sixth position. B flat major. flat major is the exact same fingerings, the exact same shifts, starting on the one string lower, the C string, E flat major. And that takes you all the way to the ends of the two octave scales in which you can start really learning a lot of a lot of music, a lot of music. If you have just a general understanding of this, and again, I'll repeat myself, you don't need to know every scale to play a single song. But if I take a piece of music right now, which I'm going to do, I'm not even going to look. Well, I have to look a little bit. I'm going to just do this. Mm, stop. And okay, maybe not that one. <laughs> Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. Uh, maybe not that one. Say stop. Uh, okay, maybe not that one. <laughs> ah, here we go. Here we go. And so, boom, music in front of you. First thing that you look at is what? What key signature is? There's two hashtags in there. 
That's D major. Already are you thinking, okay, how good is my knowledge of D major? Can I play one octave, two octave? Can I play it on a string? Can I play with different fingerings? Can, do I know the relative minor to the, all of these simple questions are already answered if you have gone through the first four uh, exercises in my scale book, five exercises in my scale book. They're all there. So D major. There we go. Boop. And a way you can keep track of your progress on cello is to have a chart like the one you see here. And this chart shows me, the student, if I am really good at what I do. So we have D major. And for me, I find this very complicated grades. Grading smile means I'm good. Straight face means I'm okay, or maybe I'm not sure. And sad face means, well, I don't know it. So D major. We see there's nothing here in the D major. So if I were to pick that piece, the intermezzo, the tom play arrangement from the Carmen's the Suite, uh, the intermezzo, beautiful piece, and I were to give it to a student who is unawares of the D major and who is unawares of the fifth position and the fourth position, that student, and clearly, if this student were this one here, as a teacher, I would be very unconfident this student would know what to do and the student as well. So let's see if we can build the confidence in the student.